Coming from Cincinnati, this is the Spin Lob. Hi, and welcome to the Spin Lob. I am your host, Nick Helwig. Uh, tonight, Mike Jones is on vacation, or actually probably traveling back from vacation uh, at this point in time. Uh, this is Season 1, Episode 11, titled A Tale of Two Teams, as tonight we talk with uh, head coach Olivia from Thomas Worthington and uh, Worthington Kilborn, as well as one of her former players, uh, Melanie Fisher. And then on the national scene, we get to talk with uh, Felix. Uh, the Spin Lab is produced and recorded live by Mike Jones and Nick Helwig. It's supported by the Ohio Squirrels. You're never too old to get in the game, go nuts. And also by Marlins Water Polo. For the love of the game, there's Marlins Water Polo. This podcast is all about Ohio Water Polo and how we fit into the national scene. It's a combination of what's going on in Ohio and the Midwest, as well as the national level. Uh, last week was an adult only, as an adult water polo only, as we talked about some master's programs from Cincinnati, Indianapolis, and Cleveland to see how they run their program and what it's like to play in water polo once you get out of college. As we do every week, we do hope everyone is staying healthy and being responsible as we are seeing cases of COVID rising. Uh, tonight, we'll talk a little bit about the state of water polo in Ohio and get started on our state spotlights on Ohio teams. Uh, we start in the state capitol with the girls coach, Thomas Worthington, Worthington Kilborn, um, and then we will move into talking about Brown University and uh, with their coach and talking about what it means to play on those different types of levels. So for our Ohio update, uh, plans and preparations are still continuing for the fall season in Ohio. As of right now, we are still green lighted. Uh, and that is good news. I know on Twitter, I've seen posts from uh, Thomas Worthington, Worthington Kilbourne, Napoleon, Upper Arlington, Sycamore, uh, and, and, I'm trying, and, and St. X all about their summer workouts. Uh, but I know a lot of those are kind of winding down as we gear up towards August. We're just about two weeks away from that. Uh, the Ohio Water Polo Coach Association finalized the end of the season schedule uh, with a turn to regional playoffs, which we haven't seen in a long time, uh, for teams to make it to the state. Um, the location, the regionals, uh, and state has not been finalized, but each region is going to have uh, set teams. So Cincinnati and Dayton will make up the southern region. Uh, while Columbus, Napoleon, and Toledo teams make up the Northern Division. Uh, on the boys' side, that means there are about seven Southern teams, about nine Northern teams. On the girls' side, there's six Southern teams and five Northern teams. Uh, each region will send three teams to compete at the state tournament. Uh, last time we had the regionals was back in 2013, uh, where Mason defeated Sycamore in the state finals. And on the boys' side, St. Charles defeated St. X in that year. Uh, while we are seeing positive signs, uh, there are some announcements that kind of bring some dark clouds into the polo field. Uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania did announce that they are playing, but places like the Ivy League uh, and the Ohio Valley Conference just talked about they are postponing the start of their 2020 season, um, as well as some of the leagues in California. Uh, and so what this does mean is we need to make sure we're all wearing masks because we want a season. Uh, and other good news, though, uh, NISCA just announced their 2019-2020 All-American list. Uh, this has seen one of the largest increases of Ohio players on this list. On the boys' side, James DeSalle from uh, Leo St. Francis and Avery Voss from Upper Arlington earned spots on the four-team All-American list. Thomas Lennox and Seth Miller, both graduates from St. Charles, earned honorable mention. And on the girls' side, uh, Caroline Colombo from Upper Arlington also made honorable mention. To give you an idea how impressive that is, uh, it takes multiple years going back uh, to get that same number of people. Uh, Max Deal from Sycamore in 2018-19. Kendra Sheehan from Upper Arlington in 17-18. Patrick Hudak from St. X. Ben Sugar from St. Charles. And Catherine Trace from 2016-17. That is an awesome uh, group of people for those guys and girls to join into in, in such a large number, which is awesome. Um, now let's kind of turn over to what's going on in Ohio. With the high school season coming up shortly, we wanted to get into our team spotlights. Uh, so I would like to welcome uh, Coach Olivia and Melanie from Worthington Kilborn onto the show. And actually, Olivia is both Thomas and Kilborn. So welcome to the show, ladies. Yeah, thank you for having us. Hi. <laughs> um, 
Olivia, you're a native of Ohio, uh, and actually you were a rival of Worthington. I did some deep searching, played for Upper Arlington uh, yeah. back in helping win a state title in 2003. Is that correct? Um, actually, we won the state championship 2003, 2004, 2005 were you when on? I was there. Okay. I, yeah. On Twitter, when I searched back long, with, I could only see the 2003 one. Oh, and 2002, but I did nothing on that team as I was a freshman. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and... So this past spring, actually, you were named the 2019 Central Ohio Waterpolo Girls Coach of the Year. Uh, so congratulations on that. Um, that Thank is you. is pretty awesome. Um, and so being a coach of both Thomas and Kelborn, what what kind of opportunities and challenges does that present you as you're coaching two distinct high school teams in the same season? Um, you know, I actually, I see it as more of a positive than a negative. Um, there are some things that can be challenging. You have double the groups of parents, <laughs> double the groups of athletes, two athletic directors to report to. Um, so those aspects can be challenging. But um, on the flip side, you know, I always tell my players, we always have another varsity team to scrimmage. And when you look at, you know, Kilborn has had a small team every year that I have coached. You know, we only had 11 girls on the roster last year. So we would not have been able to scrimmage had we not had Thomas at practice with us and vice versa for Thomas. They got Kilborn to scrimmage against every practice and do drills with. So um, I really think that it can spark a competitive edge in a good way. Um, but it also does provide opportunities, you know, whereas other teams might be scrimmaging their JV players. Um, we get to scrimmage, you know, and practice with another varsity team. So I really do see it as, you know, more of a positive than a negative. And that's, that's something I had not thought of on the negative side. I didn't think about dealing with two eighties. Like that yep. <laughs> is something that uh, I, I'm sure can, can kind of be, you know, scheduling and, and meetings yeah. and all that stuff. Um, but had not thought about the scrimmaging aspect of that where, yeah. where, yeah, you scrimmage either yourselves or your JV team, but that that's, that's a pretty big positive. Yeah, uh, I think so too. Melanie, what are your kind of thoughts on that? Do you see that Thomas players as like a, big family or are they your your competition um in tournaments there are in our, our competition but honestly i view the thomas girls as another teammate i mean we swam with them too but i love those girls just as much as i love my own kilborn teammates so i thought it was a super positive it's really cool to like know other people that are in your community that go to a different high school and get to like see their perspective and their experiences and experience the same sport together so i thought it was super cool and you guys have a joint senior night, correct? It's a Thomas Kilborn senior night. How, how does that go? Um, so basically we scrimmage, we just scrimmage each other, like the girls and the boys, but it's once again, it's like, it's no different than just having one senior night because we all know each other so well and we've been playing together for four years. So it's like a really fun and exciting like experience to get to have like our senior night with people that we've been playing with that even though they go to different high school. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I was trying to think about that. It just, like you said, it's just a big kind of family with that, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, um, something, that, something that I think that um, kind of gets missed sometimes is each team is each other's biggest cheering section. Um, so if Kilborn is in a really tough game, you have Thomas right there cheering them on. And when Thomas is in a tough game, you've got the Kilborn girls being the loudest ones in the stand. So that's something that um, a lot of other teams don't really get that I'm lucky that we get. Now, I, I've talked with uh, Jeff Gear, who once was in your position on the guy side, and they actually had it where it was a Thomas Kilborn State final. And I don't know if it's true or not, but he, he claims to have sat in the center of the pool and, and, co and coached from there as both teams played each other. I don't know if that's true. Is that what you – if, if Thomas and Kilborn make it this year to state finals, is that what you gonna, are you going to do? Um, honestly, that is my dream goal as a coach, is having a Thomas <laughs> Kilborn State final. Um, I'll just retire after that year. I'll be done. Um, cause I'll know that that's the best you can do. Um, but I don't know. It depends because when we've played each other before, sometimes the refs, you know, take it very seriously, which I mean, a state championship would be very serious, of course. Um, but when we played each other, I know once at Sycamore, I got to sit in the middle. So that was fun. Um, so I don't know. It would just, it would have to depend, I guess. <laughs> uh, last season, you know, speaking of good season, last season, you went 22, six and one, which is, is a phenomenal great season um and you were in the top of the rankings for pretty much the entire season 
what do you think is, is one of those successes that you guys had? What, what helped bring that about? Um, I think the key to last year's Kilborn team was definitely the leadership and the team chemistry. Um, if you looked at that roster on paper, um, with no disrespect to any of my girls, that would not be a roster that would be doing well in the state. We had 11 girls, one of which who could not play the entire season. And on top of that, three of them were brand new players. So we had seven players who had played the game at some point before. Um, so on paper, maybe not the, the deepest team or the most intimidating team. Um, but what we did have was three amazing seniors, Melanie being one of them, along with um, Cleo and Katie. And those three did a phenomenal job, um, not only as a group of leaders, because they got along really well, but their leadership styles really complemented each other. So they really, you know, the team was in really good hands with the, those three um, leaders. They knew exactly what they wanted. Um, traditionally not being on great teams, they, they knew that they wanted to turn that around and they worked really hard for it and set a good example. Um, and then that really started at the top and it really went through the whole team. So the chemistry was, was great. It was a full team effort. There was not a single person who was not vital to our success at some person or at some point during the season. Um, every single person had to play. Um, you know, we had freshmen up against Upper Arlington. You know, it was just, it was kind of a, it was kind of a wild ride. Um, but I would definitely say it was the leadership and the chemistry of the full team that made that, that successful, that season as successful as it was. Yeah, well, like a small classroom, a small team, you can't hide. <laughs> yes. you've, got to, you've got to literally sink or swim on that one. Yes, Melanie, absolutely. For you last year, what was one of your standouts that, that made it successful for you? Um, so I think the, my like biggest thing is like chemistry for the team, but I wanted, I wanted to change the atmosphere and like the dynamic of the team. Honestly, we had Kilborn hadn't been more of a, oh, well, we kind of got far. Like, you know, we kind of worked hard. Like we're kind of there, but you know, that's the end of the season. Oh, well, I wanted everyone to like work hard and I wanted people to want to be at practice. And I think that's like, and I wanted it to be fun and I wanted people to enjoy water polo as much as I did. And I think by the end of the season that really turned around for the whole entire team. Like I loved being at practice. I didn't want practice to end. Like I loved being with my teammates. I loved playing and like each and every one of us pushed each other in a different aspect, whether it was like in the weight room or in the pool at morning practice. And I think that was really vital to our team is like changing the atmosphere and having that, good positive mindset for sure yeah I, I can't agree with you more if if you hate being at practice it's going to make that mood of not wanting to practice hard but if you love being there you're going to work that much harder I think that's a that's a, a outstanding attitude to have for any player to want to have um, and next season you're heading off to George Washington correct yes I am <laughs> uh, and so what made you uh, want to take that next step and, and head to George Washington and, and you know, what, what are you excited about? What are you nervous about heading up there to play? Um, so when I, my senior season, I didn't actually still know if I wanted to play in college, but since I had such a great season, I was like, I can't give this up. Like I have to keep on playing. This is just too great to lose. Um, and for me, I'm just extremely competitive and aggressive. So I'm like, if I'm going to do it, I might as well go all the way and go D1 and Cause like, that's just kind of like my personality. Um, so, and I really liked, I like George Washington also for the academics and the campus is really cool. That'll be in the city. So I think it's definitely going to be a unique experience from the suburbs of Ohio to city living in DC. So that should be fun. And I really like um, what, what um, coach Barry has been doing with the um, team and how he's been turning it around and they're doing a really good job the past couple of seasons. Yeah, and so you're really going to want to pay attention to the later part of this, this podcast as we try to pick uh, Felix's brain so you can get some scoops on what did, how you're going to beat Brown this, this coming spring. Um, so, Olivia, looking at this upcoming season, what, do you, what are your guys' strengths again uh, for both Thomas and Kilborn? Uh, maybe who are your leaders you see stepping up, you know, or any closer records, or, you know, how are we going to shake out with the team from Columbus now? Um, so, you know, honestly, who, who knows what this season has in store, um, but, you know, we're going to find a way to make something work, of course. Um, but I am really, really excited for both teams to show a lot of growth. 
Um, on Thomas, I have eight seniors, and that's a really big class. But then everyone else ha is either brand new to water polo or it'll be their second year playing. Um, I have Maya Lynn returning, who was our leading goal scorer last year and our primary center defender. And Nevin Woods, who started playing center last year. Melanie really helped her out a lot. Um, and she, she really grew a lot and improved a lot. And I'm excited to watch her continue that growth this year. Um, and then Izzy Thomas, who was our goalie with 240 some blocks last year. Um, so we have a strong core returning. Um, and then we also have Natalia Kalurgis, Katie Bazzotti, Annalise Eisenstein, Lauren Justice, and Vivian Strange rounding up that class. Um, so there will be, a, you know, a great, a great group of seniors leading that class. Um, and then on top of that, with all the, the newer players, I'm so excited to see them get some varsity time and really, you know, improve a lot as the season goes on. Um, so I, I think that's going to be a fun season. With Kilbourne, once again, um, the theme is going to be tiny but mighty. Um, <laughs> we, we have a very small roster. <laughs> um, but our three returning senior, seniors, Lauren Richner, E.B. Saunders, and Fiona Saunders, um, I think are going to be three of the best female players in the state. So I am really excited to watch them lead. Um, other than that, we have our juniors, Nanami Campbell and Adriana Dolciato, who will, I think, really, really support that senior class. And then I'm, I'm really excited for um, our newer players and then our two sophomores, Kennedy O'Brien and Allie Brown, to really step up um, and, and get some more minutes on the varsity level. And I think, um, once again, we're not going to be an intimidating team to look at, but I think that this team will surprise a lot of people this year. So I'm excited to watch them play. Well, we, we saw what happened last time when it didn't look like on paper is going to be a dominant team, and then you kind of dominate throughout the whole season. So yeah. uh, that would be very fun to kind of watch and see. Uh, thinking back in, in the past a little bit, um, back in 2016, something kind of really unthinkable happened. Um, Olivia, you lost a former player. Melanie, you lost your sister and ended up in the hospital. Um, and I stumbled upon an interview, Olivia, you gave with a local newspaper, and you said how proud of the girls you were and how they handled it. Uh, it was an extremely difficult week and the team spent a lot of time together as a family. Um, and I think, I think that's huge. And, and Melanie, you've already mentioned how much the family, the water polo team is. How did, how do you foster that type of family mentality that supports a team in a time of tragedy, not just in a team, a time of success? Uh, how, Olivia, how do you feel like that kind of, how, how have you helped develop that? Um, I think it's something that has to be developed before a tragedy strikes. I mean, obviously no one plans for a situation like that to happen. Um, but luckily with the group of girls we had, you know, they were so supportive of each other. And, you know, we had a variety of girls and this is Kilbourne and Thomas. Um, it obviously affected Kilbourne very much, but people forget Thomas, you know, those were girls who played with Courtney too. And, um, played against Courtney and there were newer players who she was taking under their wing to teach them new skills at practice. Um, so there was a variety of different, you know, people were coming from a variety of different places. Um, so it was really spending a lot of time together um, as much as we could, even when we didn't want to be around each other. Um, those are, you know, plenty of time, um, but trying to be flexible at practice with what the players need. Um, those first, I mean, honestly, throughout the whole season, we still had practice because like we didn't miss a practice, even though, you know, we still had players in the hospital, but some, some players needed that structure. They needed to be at practice. They needed that sense of normalcy to cope. Whereas others would come, but not get in the water. They would just stand by the pool and be around their teammates. Um, and some would get in their suit, but some days get in some not. Um, and it really just, it was being flexible with the needs. Um, you know, it was a, it was a tremendous, shared trauma that not only affected, you know, our four girls who were in the hospital um, recovering and the Fisher family who is so beloved to Kilbourne water polo, um, you know, truly just everything you want in a water polo parents um, and supporters. So it was, it was really hard time for their family, our water polo family, but really just emphasizing that time being together and understanding that people are going to cope in different ways and how can we, you know, support each other through that. And, and Melanie, I mean, as someone who's gone through that tragedy, I, I can't even imagine what you had to do, but then also the physical recovery to get to now where you're going to go play division one. What, what kind of was going through your mind? How did you take those steps to, to get back to the level you're at now? Um, 
For me, my recovery was pretty prolonged. So I ended up having seven surgeries and I didn't end up getting in the pool until about eight months later. So it was mentally, it was super tough. Uh, physically, I just, I did what I had to do. Like I went into super focus mode, like either it's the same way I play water pool. I just get super focused and like all I can think about is getting better and getting to play. And it was, it was really hard watching those games of my teammates playing and being like, I should be in the pool, but I can't. And so that was my really big motivator is like, I want to come back sophomore season and I want to prove myself and I want to show this is where I, this is how I deal with setbacks. And then it just kind of went from sophomore season. Hey, like this is going pretty well. Let's see how much further I can get. And then my senior season, I was like, I want to be the best. This is what I have to do. So I don't know. I just kind of get (laughs) hyper-focused. And that's definitely not a bad thing. I think something that was really important too was that, you know, Courtney was someone who loved water polo so much at every level, whether it was, you know, her playing D1 at Marist or, um, you know, down to brand new players who started as a junior who could barely swim. Um, She really loved teaching everyone the game and sharing the love that she had. So a lot of the players, and I know me as a coach, you know, we were able to tap into Courtney's passion for water polo and, you know, kind of continue on in her honor. So that was really important, I think, to, you know, the team. Absolutely. I I can't imagine, like, the strength you guys help show each other uh, and the family, Um, especially kind of relating that a little to our time right now, very uncertainty, um, and, and unfortunately, someone in our pool community is going to kind of go through a super hardship. Do you guys have any advice to help those people or help those teams kind of cope with this time period relating to kind of what you guys went through? I'll give that to Melanie first. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, it's, I like, I get it. It's really hard staying motivated, but I'm also, once again, I'm really competitive. So I like to think about, the end goal. And, you know, I'm here, I'm getting better. I'm working out for my teammates. I'm, I'm getting better. I'm either, whether it's like schoolwork and like, it's hard to be motivated for even that, especially like when we're online for classes, but like, it's, it's still something to get you out of bed. And, you know, um, it's cliche, but you got to stay positive. It really is because that positive mindset really does change the atmosphere of everything, whether it's in the classroom or on a team, or even just in a club, like, you know, everyone wants to be in that positive atmosphere. No one wants to be on a negative team. So you just kind of have to keep that for your own. You have to be your own team, your own cheerleader. So cliche, but I'm here for it. (laughs) They're cliche for a reason because they, they make sense and and they're true. Yeah. I would definitely say, um, you know, everyone's going to go through this process differently. Even though we are all experiencing this global pandemic, um, people are going to process it differently and um, cope with it differently. So just being understanding and compassionate to those around you um, while also, you know, allowing, you know, giving yourself some compassion during this hard time as well. Um, I think that, you know, it's it's a very unpredictable time. There are some days where I want to pull my hair out and some days where I think, you know, we're going to get through this. Um, but just really relying on your support system and then just being understanding that everyone's going through a really tough time right now. Yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap this up on a more positive note. Let's talk about some skills and tactic stuff here. Um, Melanie, what was the hardest drill your coach put you through in, when you played for her? Um, so, we um forgot the ball bag and water pool and water (laughs) bottles a lot um a couple of like my junior season so we had to do up and outs where you progressively ladder so you swim across the pool you do a push-up you swim back you do a sit-up and then you we had to get up to however many water bottles and water polo balls we left so one not only did i get in shape from that we never left them again And honestly, I think I've never wanted to cry more during practice than those moments is when it was Uh, so hard. I'm not going to lie. We just did that this Sunday in our master's program. And I still feel like I'm going to die. 
I cannot <laughs> get anything off a top shelf. So that is, and I might use that this season when my kids will forget something. There's nothing it's that great. made me more angry and like, just like so mad. I was like, oh my God, why did we forget them? But it's a team effort remembering those things. So you can't put it on one person. Everyone's got to help each other out. So That is true. All right, Olivia, what other than making your kids do up and outs, what is your favorite drill to run in practice? Um, I really like tread sets. Um, I think that, um, you know, having a strong base in the water is really important. And, you know, having players who, I get a lot of players who've never even really swam before, who don't maybe have the same level of comfort in the water that people who grew up doing club swimming, you know, that they have. So I really like tread sets. Um, primarily because at the beginning of the season, you give them a tread set and you see a lot of girls look at you like you are torturing them and wondering why no one's like calling 911 because this coach is abusing them. And then, you know, in a few short weeks, they're like, oh, that was so easy. Why, why did I think that was so hard? So it's a good way to measure, you know, how they're, how they're improving. So I really, I really like tread sets. All right, but it does I... depend on the, the season because, or the part of the season, because I do, I do take joy in up and out day. There's usually an excuse for one a season. Oh, did Nick go away? Yeah, my favorite is when it was – that's another thing about having two teams, though, is either Thomas had to do it and it was nice being able to sit out and watch them have <laughs> to do it and we didn't have to do it. But vice versa, having to be the ones to do it was not enjoyable. Yeah, it truly was a lesson for both teams because, you know, if Kilborn forgot the water bottles, Thomas was privately having a conversation saying, we're not going to do that this season. But there's usually one cause a season for each team to definitely do that drill. I, I still can't believe you coach both teams at the same time. <laughs> that is I, absolutely – I remember when Jeff did it, and I because I'm good friends with Jeff. I've known Jeff a long time. Yeah. And I used to – like. It, I guess it didn't hit me so – I just like I never really understood it how like you can coach two different teams that play against each other but obviously it's it's got to be crazy yeah I mean I will definitely you know my assistant coaches have to be good on the stats because when I move on to that next game because a lot of times they're back to back my brain has shut off the last game so if a player comes and talks to me when there was a game in between that wasn't theirs, you know, cause the most recent game for them is fresh on their brain. I'm like, I don't know what happened. You know, <laughs> you, you, I, I don't know. You'll have to go look at the stats. Like I just, I don't remember game scores. I don't remember who we've played in the weekend. Like it's all about just being in the moment because, but, but then I can't remember anything. So I mm. like, I, in the middle of games, Melanie knows, I always have to go, how many kickouts do you have? Just because I am confusing None. 12 I'm... games in my head. But <laughs> Melanie would never have a kickout though. No. And so, so you could... never, so the, the boys and the girls season, are they different? No. So in Ohio, um, the cur currently boys and girls are both in the fall. Um, so even so, yeah. you, you guys are really going to try to play this fall. That's the plan um, right now. We will see. Yeah. I just, I'm hoping we get a season in any, in any form. Yeah, um, I, I want I want a season and I want a safe season. Yeah. I, I went to, obviously I've been through all this stuff since I started planning on, um, on the NCAA part of it for a while because I knew this was coming. I was talking to enough people. I'm like, I want to be prepared because if they give me the worst, if this is the worst. I, I want my athletes to have hope, right? Because you yeah. always want hope. And even if we were to play in the fall, my mindset is, you know how difficult it's going to be? How uncomfortable? It's like walking on eggshells. And why would you, I don't, I don't know why anybody would want to do that. Parents can't enjoy the game, socially yeah. distance. It's like, it's just not, if you really truly care about the student athlete experience, then you, and, and your own safety, like for us, we're not the youngest, you know, group, you know, the young, you know, the, I guess this perception of young athletes, they can be <laughs> invincible, but I, yeah. I think it's, I think it's just like the student athlete experience is such an important part that if we can make something work in the, in the spring, we should. And I, and I think that I don't, I don't necessarily, and Melanie for you, I don't necessarily know if the women's season is going to start on time. I think it's, I think we have to be prepared to, to just get what we can. And the one thing I can tell you right now is if, if we're not playing in the spring, bad stuff happens, <laughs> you yeah. know, bad stuff happens. So I'm hope I'm, I'm optimistic that we will like with the right time of planning, we could do it in the spring, but there's no way 
I would do anything in the fall. I, I just, if I had a choice, you know, I, I couldn't agree more with you. And I think it is going to be a topic at our um, coaches meeting that we have coming up because ultimately I know every coach in Ohio, you know, we really do value that, that high school, that athletic experience. So, you know, I think finding a way, finding a way to get it yeah. done in the safest way possible, I think is on every coach's brain right now. So I, I completely agree. Yeah. Melanie, Absolutely. what's your, what's your plan? I'm sorry. Sorry, Nick. I just want to ask. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> what's your, what's the, what's the GW plan for you to, to, to go in the fall? Um, so right now we're having hybrid classes. Um, we still have a practice schedule, but they're still coordinating with the athletic department. Um, GW men's team doesn't have a season as of right now. They canceled yeah. theirs too. So, um, are you allowed on campus? We're allowed on campus. Oh, so that's awesome. Yeah, I'm super excited about that. Um, so we'll have a hybrid classes of some in person, some online during the week. So, I mean, it's always up to change. And that's kind of how everyone's college courses are going that we might get sent home yeah. mid October if we have to. And so I'm just I'm prepared for anything. But I'm I'm just staying positive. Hey, I'm on campus. Hey, we might be able to practice. Hey, I might have a season. Yeah, I think I think this is going to be a big testament to your uh, generation. Can you guys just understand how important it is to follow the rules and not and not let Friday nights and Saturday nights turn into, you know, stuff that can make things more difficult. You know, I like I've already had a talk with my teams about being leaders on campus. And well, hey, if you're on campus, you're, cur you're I don't want I don't want to have to give you a curfew. I don't want to have to treat you like a 17 year old. I want to treat you like an adult. And this is this. I actually think this is going for a lot of reasons. Again, looking at the silver lining, this gives the young this young generation of 18 to 22 year olds an opportunity to show they're responsible to help this, you know, us get back on track. I believe in you guys. I believe, I in, believe in them too. <laughs> I would also, I would also argue that I think water polo players are probably better equipped to handle this than a lot of other athletes and non-athletes because part of being a water polo player is being adaptable to any situation, um, you know, and really handling whatever's coming at you. So I think, I think our high school water polo players, well, it's not going to be easy for anyone. I think. I think they're up to the task for sure. Yeah, if you can well, play in the is, spring, you should. That's my yeah. my advice. <laughs> it's not scientifically proven yet, but I think maybe the amount of chlorine that we've ingested may <laughs> give us a slight edge in not getting sick. I, there's no science behind it, but I'm I'm using my cross fingers to hope that. Um, I'm hoping. I'm hoping as well. Yeah. Well, um, Olivia, any final advice that you can give Melanie as she gets ready to have college or any of the other graduating seniors that, that are heading off to, like we just said, a, a very unknown situation? Um, I don't have any specific advice for Melanie. Melanie's always been fine without me. So um, <laughs> I know she's going to be up to task. Um, it's going to be for the first time she's going to have to be you know, bottom of the totem pole. She never really experienced that at Kilbourne. Um, so she's going to have to you know, claw her way to get some playing time and prove, you know, just how good and how awesome she is. So I, I think, I think she's going to be just fine. I think her life experience has prepared her well. Um, and as for all, you know, graduating seniors, I, I truly think um, while it sucks, <laughs> I mean, there's no, there's no other way to say it. it um, you know, this, this time kind of sucks. Um, you know, there will be a time where this is in, in the past, and, you know, you want to make sure that you've done something that you are proud of in the future. And, um, you know, you know, whether that's being responsible, like you talked about, Felix, or, you know, just making sure that you're, you're making the most of the opportunities that you do have at this time. Um, so I think that, like I said, I think our water polo players will be just, just primed for a crazy 2020, 2021. Yeah. So, I, um, yeah. I, I, I'll tell you something, Melanie, just obviously just listening to you right now, I'm, I'm a fan and, you're more prepared than you realize for this, right? And I, I can, the advice I will give you, not that you're asking for it, but if, if being a division one athlete was easy, everybody would do it, right? And your mindset is, is built for this. And I, I look forward to watching you dominate and be very successful against every team except Brown in your college career. So I was gonna say, <laughs> you know, mid game, against Brown University on that one. So yeah. when you say, I, I, you know, when you told me to dominate, here's that dominating coach. Yeah. 
As long as we end up with the W, I don't care. You can score 10 oh. goals. We win 11 to 10. I'm happy. <laughs> Ooh, I want to go to this game. This oh, is gonna be good. boy. <laughs> I'm, ju I'm just excited. I think I'm just really excited to get to that next level. I mean, I've obviously, like, I'm scared because, once again, I'm going to be on that bottom of the totem pole, but nothing better than working your way up. So <laughs> you have experience with that with Kilbourne, you know, going from last place in the state to third in, what, yeah. two years, one year. I think you'll be okay. That is awesome. Well, thank you two for joining us. Uh, that was a fantastic conversation. I wish we had more time to talk uh, with that. You two, good luck on your seasons, whenever the seasons are. So thank you so much for coming right, thank on. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you for having us. Good luck. Thank you. All right, now turning to the national scene, I'd like to introduce my new co-host. Sorry, Mike Jones, I am now firing you, and, and Felix is going to be my new co-host on that one. <laughs> um, he's the head coach at Brown University. Uh, many of you actually probably had, had a chance to meet him back when he was the uh, what, designing curriculum for the Ohio water polo camp. Yep. Um, he, I mean, it, uh, a wealth of knowledge, 12 years as a high school coach, three years at MIT, 13 years at Brown, um, over 280 wins in the last couple, in the last 13 seasons. Um, I'm just kind of looking through all the accolades, four time uh, coach of the year with CWPA men's three time coach of the year. Uh, I mean, that, there's a list that goes on and on. Um, did I miss anything in there? <laughs> you, I think you said plenty. And I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm. Uh, if you, if you can see me right now, I'm pretty blessed. Yeah, I don't like. I said for all the, for all the individual accolades that might be under my resume, it's, it took a lot of us great assistant coaches and great athletes to, to help me get those. So as much as I'm, I'm proud of them. I'm proud of them because it represents my my program and my athletes and my coaches. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and for those who may not have checked out any of his interviews, super humble too. I mean, you, you, you give all your praise to your players for what you do on a lot of that. Yeah. How, how can you not? I think it's, you know, it's, it's without them, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have a profession and without them, they wouldn't define what we do. We wouldn't be able to, to, uh, yeah, do what we do. <laughs> Um, so I got a chance to uh, kind of watch your interview with American Water Polo. And if you haven't checked that out, they, he did one on recruiting. Um, and you talked about one of the most important things is character. Can you really um, elaborate on what you mean by like character and, and why is that so important for anybody to play, but also to join Brown? Well, I think every coach would probably tell you the same thing. It's the character is important because it's the team sport. And at this level, um, when you're dealing with young adults, you're, you're dealing with adults. And I, I think that it takes, it, it being a really, really good player isn't going to be good enough in order to have a cohesive unit because winning is a byproduct of that, right? So, um, you know, at this level, we, we all get pretty good players and, um, and the difference ultimately is which teams have an opportunity to blend together. There are some, you know, there are some ath um, athletes that get away with, with not being the best characters just because they're that talented or their team is, is, is made, um, gets through it. Um, because, but I look at more of that as an exception than the norm. I think the norm is you, you put a group of people together, men or women that want the same thing and respect each other. And, and character is a big part of that. I keep forgetting that you can't see me cause I'm nodding the entire time that you're, you're <laughs> saying that, um, you also mentioned that sometimes these things are called cliche. We, we even said that earlier on in the, in the podcast here, but one of the things you talk about being coachable, right? And, and I think we all talk about that. I know I, I always talk about the players that want to go play that you need to be coachable. So in your mind, what, what does that look like for a player? I mean, you have to be able to take, to, to be, to take criticism. I mean, that's what coaching is. You got to be coached. So like, I, I, I'm sure that every athlete that we come across that we have to correct or we have to, to um, get back on track is probably uncomfortable being put on the spot. So, uh, you know, that you could either just be defiant, right? Or you can accept the, the, the constructive criticism of the, of the advice that you're getting from your coach and, and, try, and, and try something different. I think that's important because, you know, we're, we're dealing with, you know, college coaches, we're dealing with, with athletes that are coming from totally different. We're dealing with athletes that are coming from areas and are coached by coaches that only do it part-time. You know, some of the athletes that we're recruiting are being, um, are being coached by Olympians or national team level coaches. And they all, but for us, we all expect them to, to do it the same way and, and, and have that same mindset. And, 
you know, I'm not going to get, you know, I, I don't think it's appropriate to set, have someone say, well, you know, um, Brian Flax coached me so I can pretty much do whatever I need to do. I mean, that's never happened. Cause I think it's just one thing that these good coaches, they teach their kids is to be coachable, but that's a big part of, of it. And it's cliche because it's like, of course you want to be coachable. It's what we do. We coach. Right. But it's, it's not as easy as that is all the time. Yeah, one thing I I've always found interesting is like when I'm trying to instruct a player and they apologize, I'm sorry for doing something wrong. Cause you're kind of pointing out, you know, you're falling on your back. And so one thing I told the kids is, is, you know, don't tell me you're sorry. Just, just go fix it. You know, you make a mistake. We're all going to make a mistake. Just show me what you want to do. Go, show me how you're going to fix it. Yeah, that's, that actually happens a lot more than not. And I actually stopped. I used to get mad when they said sorry over and over. I'm like, stop saying it. I get it. Now I, it, it, and then I also made it a point that it's let them say whatever they feel comfortable saying and, and, not, and not even acknowledge it. Saying, okay, yep. Or, and then and don't fixate yourself as a coach on them apologizing. Just let them say it because they obviously want to. And then just as a coach – but this is something that I had to learn to do. I just move on to the next thing and just say, great. Um, I'm, I'm the type of coach that if I'm playing someone and I pull them out to, to, cons- to give them constructive criticism, 99% of the time I'm throwing them right back in. Like, it's like the, I think the best way to make them feel that you believe in them is like, tell them what they need to do better and give them an opportunity to do it. Right. To Absolutely. try to do it. I think that there's, there, there might be coaches out there that, pull a kid, yell at them, or give them the, the criticism or the coaching and then not let them get back out there and play. And I think that's something that I've also had to learn to do. Yeah. And I think that goes along with, you had talked about building a, a culture of a positive mindset. Um, so, so how can coaches, you know, kind of help build that? What is, what is, you know, the steps for coaches and, and captains to build that, that positive mindset? I think it's a, it's, um, it's a collective um, goal. I, 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 we don't have captains at Brown. I just, I, I kind of got rid of them a while ago just because I felt like if you need a title to lead, are you a leader? You know, it's like just lead and you, being a captain just comes part of it, right? You rather be a captain, you rather be the leader. And I think everyone would rather choose being a leader because a leader is, is something that obviously requires people to follow. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it's a, it has to be a collective responsibility of everyone, whether they're freshmen, whether they're seniors. Um, it works for me. That type of, of, of um, community and the culture works for me. It might not work for everyone because some, some coaches might need more direct um, hierarchy as far as these are, the, these are your captains, this is what happens. And I'm, I don't, I'm not poo-pooing on anyone's. Um, I'm not saying having no captains, everyone should do that. I'm just saying it works for me might not work for everyone but i think it has to be a collective goal of everyone on involved and they have to feel they have to feel invested in it and i think that's the key is how do you get them to make sure that everyone the the worst player on the team or the player that gets the least amount of playing time how do you make them feel invested because i can't go back to cliches you're only as good as your weakest link and trust me i i'm i truly believe that you're only mm-hmm. as good as the 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 there's going to be a time in practice where five of your athletes are out and you're going to need every single member of your, of your team to participate, to get a productive practice. So you have to make sure that they're all evolving. They're all getting better. Yeah. I, like you just said, everybody's in practice, you're practicing against each other. And so if you don't help your lower players get better, then you're not having higher competition. Not all of us have a Thomas Worthington, Worthington Kilborn situation where we can scrimmage another varsity team. (laughs) But you've done very well, 280 wins. So you obviously know your X's and O's, right? So um, in your Zoom call with uh, – Zooming with the Bears, I think you call it, uh, from CWPA, you mentioned that you spend as much time working on the vertical as the horizontal. And so you one of the big drills was the big gallon jugs. I think you know every team likes to do that one because it's a good kind of show um, to really kind of get your RPMs of your egg beater going. Uh, can you think of any other examples of good key vertical activities that players can be doing as they, as they practice? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I was thinking about this question. I think that, I think it's important that you understand that the, the legs, the, the, how each athlete uses their legs is different. Like you can't take a goalie drill and, and make your centers and center defenders do it and think that they're going to, their leg strength is going to improve for their job. 
I think every coach needs to kind of, I use bands to stretch cords a lot because I think it helps you, your centers and center defenders have to have a specific way of working their legs. Where are they, where, where are they, when they're using their legs, what type of direction are they going in? And I think that that's something that I've kind of started doing more of while the jugs are great, right. To work on your leg speed and leg, I started kind of evolving more into making sure our centers are working on going backwards, holding position, being pushed forward and holding that position. Our center defenders pushing forward, right? In a in a in a in a more of a horizontal defensive position, pushing, pushing against something, really trying to move sometimes an immovable object. And your goalies are working on getting up and down. You know, they're no they're they're the goalies aren't being aren't pushing anything or being pushed by anything they're just they have to be explosive so I think as a coach you come up with these different drills and you have to study and you have to do you know do your research and I mean I'm, I'm still I think if I'm doing anything right now during this COVID um, coaching break is I'm, I'm trying to come up with and develop different things and there's so much stuff out there um, you know all these different zoom things that coaches are doing that you're, you're just observing this knowledge and seeing that everyone kind of has different ways of coaching something that might not be exactly how you're doing, but you should be able to get something out of it that al allows you to apply it to something. And I think right now, the focus for me has been mostly on like how, when they're using their legs, they're, are they pulling, are they pushing, are they exploding? And making sure that your athletes are working on those types of movements because if that's what's gonna be the most effective. Yeah. Hopefully I, I that think, makes sense. <laughs> no, it, yeah, it absolutely does. It, it, I mean, you're, you're basically, you, you can't, you don't train a goalie to be your swim off sprinter. So they're not doing the, the, the swim off sprints to practice that. So, you know, they're yeah. doing their drills. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. Um, and, and speaking of sprints on that. So obviously horizontal is a part of the game. Um, what type of like horizontal workouts are you doing? Is it just yardage? Is it skill work base? How, how does that kind of work in your practices? Yeah. I, you know, I, we, obviously everybody has to swim just because it's part of like soccer players have to run right? Basketball players have to run. It's just how much running do they actually do, right? During practice. And, okay. I, and I think that's how I, I run my water pool practice. I mean, if we can involve a ball, right, we're going to involve a ball. And that any, so any conditioning that we do that we can have a ball, I mean, they're going to have days where we, we just chase black lines as part of, again, staying in, in the best shape you can. But if I can, I, I try to, if we're going to do horizontal stuff and I can involve a ball, uh, or stopping and, and, and stop. I don't, I'm not a big 200s or, or just swimming laps just to swim laps. I, I try to mix it up. I try to have different um, movements in them because I think it's part of, you want to make things as realistic to game like as you can. And you can do that for 25s. I mean, it's just, it's just, you just have to be creative. And I think every mm -hmm. coach needs to kind of look at that and, 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 and try to see how they could apply it to that. Well, not to give away any game secrets because Melanie still might be listening and the rest of GW <laughs> might be listening, but what are like some of the most successful um, plays that you've seen ex executed or ones that you really like to execute maybe on, on six on five or, or, or counterattack defense, something like that. What, what do you think is some of those plays that you really find successful? Well, you know, it's, it's crazy you asked that because five years ago, right, five or six years ago, I probably wasn't that in tune on play I was like just play the game just fine because I, I do think as much as much as we create these plays and tactical I uh, you know so I always say you try to Madden you know or, or NBA 2k all these all these athletes sometimes out there where you try to over coach them um, but I actually think you know I started moving more towards the, like you know what giving them something to think about an attack allows them to make reads now they all know what they're kind of looking for so I don't necessarily know if, if I, if there's, I think working on after goal plays is, I think it's important. I think it's silly for anyone who not doesn't have after goal plays because why wouldn't you do something that worst case scenario, you back off the defense and then you can get in your front on court offense as quickly. And you'd be surprised how long I went with never doing after goal plays. Um, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's crazy for you, especially with the new rules, not to take advantage of the corner throw live, you know, the, I mean, these are things that you should be kind of incorporating into your, your playbook. And you don't need to call a timeout to run a play. You don't need – you can literally say, hey, corner throw, let's run 
play piggy bank, you know, and, and, and I think it's just getting your athletes comfortable because of just making reads. And I think that's it. I think plays and helping um, um, your athletes understand reads and that's how you make them better. They, so they have an opportunity to read you each, again against a good team. Option A is probably never going to be there. Option B might be there. Option T option C might be the, the bread and butter that ends up winning your games. So I, I've, I've, I don't have any particular ones that I'm going to share just because not because I don't, cause I just don't <laughs> think that way, but I can tell you right now, they're an important part of this, uh, of the game is being helping your team, teaching them how to make reads and giving them a way to, for that to happen is really critical for, I, I would say the difference between those teams that you're playing that are equal ultimately comes down to those types of tactical adjustments. Yeah. I, and, and that, I think one of the funniest things I've seen in the, in the past, we started running some plays and, you know, you're calling out play names. We had one that I, I forgot the name of it, but it actually was not a play, but we just yelled the name out and this team just kept trying to figure out what that play was. And so got more distracted by what they're trying to figure out the play was and what we were actually doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tried doing that a couple of times and my athletes always look at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> Cause I never <laughs> obviously the included thing. them in the play. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it was about maybe about two weeks ago, you, Janai, Kerr, uh, Miguel from uh, St. Louis and John Abdu had a, a really awesome discussion, um, that was recorded and I, and I hope everybody gets a chance to listen to it on diversity and water polo. Um, and, and having conversations with Janai about this and then listening to yours, you guys were kind of on ops things where you talked about how diverse your upbringing was with water polo. Is that correct on that? Yes. My, I, I was, it was, I almost, I didn't even notice it in, in my little, uh, my little uh, corner of Miami, Florida. And it, it wasn't, and maybe I became oblivious to it, but I started noticing obviously the more, the farther North I moved and the more, the more opening and the more involved that I got nationally, you, you tend to notice things a little bit more and, and not, not that, I, I and not because of 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 like people are out there obviously trying. I just think it's sometimes it's 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 easy to forget that there's there's this this um this perception that can be placed on you just because you might look a little bit different or act a little bit different. Is there anything you can you can kind of expand on? You guys talked a lot about you know playing opportunities and, and getting that. Is there something that? you know, players now can really try to help, you know, foster a community where diversity is accepted or, you know, is, is more celebrated than it, than it might be now. Well, I, I think we, we always have to be really careful. And I, I think the, uh, on this, because it, it's not like you can, you can automatically make water polo more diverse. I mean, that's kind of, that's almost silly. And it's almost like a, a an, an unrealistic, expectation especially in the short term i think i think the short term part of 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 the of the situation is education i mean look it is what i mean there's enough stories out there that it's of stuff that's going down in this country that if if you're if you still don't see that there's an issue and there's a problem then then you don't then you don't want to see it and that's fine i think it's educating um just our sport and i and i because there are a lot of people, it might have, there's, there's probably maybe, I'm just going to use the number 20 athletes out there that probably were, were turned off of the sport because of an experience, because someone made a comment. And not necessarily that that person was racist, but they made a comment because normally they make a comment and everyone's okay with it because it doesn't offend them, you know? And, and I think, um, and I think that that's the thing is edu educating people that this isn't something that, that is, it's not, it's no one's fault like I'm, I don't think we I'm not blaming anyone but it's also it's also important to help educate people that's a short term in the long term I mean yeah it'd be nice to see more more people of color playing the sport but I don't know necessarily know if that's something that our sport can provide just because of where our sport is played and what you need to play our sport that doesn't mean we don't try that doesn't mean we stop trying but I also think it's important to have realistic expectations of these these um thing i think what what usa water polo is doing with this diversity coalition or the that you know john abdu is heading and then i'm part of it um i think it's i think those are, these are some of the things that we're addressing it, as important it is to make to to try to 
to create more opportunities for for people of color to play our sport. I think I think we need to just make sure that we give more opportunity for for people of different financial <laughs> situations an opportunity to, to to play our sport regardless of what they look like. Right? They could be white, brown, yellow; it doesn't matter. Um, I think that's the key, and I think is as long as those opportunities are there, it's up to it's, then it's up to somebody else to take advantage of that. But when someone does make, nobody wants a scholarship, right? Everyone's like, oh, just let's create a scholarship. No, that's not what what we want. We just want to make sure that if we decide to to jump into the sport, that we're treated the same, and that you have to understand there's certain things you shouldn't be saying anyways, and you might get away with saying it when you're with your group of people that look like you, you have to be, number one, you have to know that's not right. And people have to hold people accountable. So if there's 10 white people in a room and someone makes a, 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 a silly joke about, you know, someone of, of a different race, someone there should be like, yeah, that's not funny. <laughs> I think that's what it takes. That type of, of, of education and reminding people that it's not funny. And, and it doesn't ha if it doesn't affect you, that doesn't mean it's okay. Does that make sense? I think sense? that goes back to leadership you talked about earlier on their teams. That, that, that shows a true leader that will stand up amongst his peers to protect all the people that he needs yeah. to. I'm, and I'm fortunate. I, I mean, I, I, I work at an incredible university. Not that other universities aren't focused on diversity or in inclusion, but, you know, I've, I've been, and maybe I've been also shielded and, protective from a lot of this stuff because I am at a university where this is, I look, I mean, everyone's different. So I'm just like everybody else. And that's the way I'm treated, which is great. And all this stuff started happening. It's, it, it's crazy. I started noticing more like, yeah, you're right. This isn't, I need to be more, more, more uh, in tune to this and understand that this is something that I also can't just not remember to fight for and not to, to, to not allow um, I, I need to be part of the educating part process as well, not just pointing out the problem, but also helping be part of the solution. And I'm holding myself accountable to be part of that. Um, and so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm like rolling up my sleeves and getting involved. I love the sport of water polo. And I've said this before, I owe water polo my, everything in my life. I might, and I have a great life. I, it, it's because of water. It's, it's because of water polo. It's because of these great people that I had an opportunity to, that, that, you know, my, one of my biggest mentors, Jim O'Neill, big old white dude, but he went to a, to a Carroll city high school, which basically 90% African American. He played water polo at Carroll city high school. And, and he was, and again, he accepted me with open arms and I, I never really noticed how, much of it was out there until I started moving away from Florida and getting more nationally. And it became more apparent that I had to be, my head was always on a swivel and I had to make sure that I stayed, um, I stayed um, focused on what I needed to do. And I, and I, I, it might not, you know, people might think it's, it, it sounds crazy, but someone like Ted Minnis and I, we, we, we have to be in our, and again, this is our perception and you can say whatever you want about our perception, but we have to be, 10 times better than the next person to be just as good. That's what we, that's what drives us. Right. But it's also, it's almost like, man, this is kind of unfair, but it is what it is. And we don't make excuses on it. And he, him and I have, have you know, and again, he is my, one of my fierce rivals, you know, but him and I have the, the last couple of months have become closer because we started recognizing how much alike we were and not just because we kind of look similar but because we, we kind of have some of the same obstacles and because we look similar. So it's, we always used to kid about it, but that's just what it is. So. And we are starting to run out of time on this, but, and, and we could talk for hours on all that. Um, but the last thing I kind of want to touch on before we kind of end tonight's cast is um, you talked about, you know, now this, the girls were canceled in the spring and the boys are now canceled in the fall. How are you keeping morale of your team together and up as you now have this extended break? Yeah. So that's a great question. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, the most important thing, and I obviously said this in a really, really heartwarming, nicer way, but we can't, this is a world problem, not a Brown problem, not a Brown university problem. So I, I was, I kind of 
again, I treat my athletes like adults. So I spoke to them as adults saying, hey, this is bigger than our sport. And we might not be able to play any sports this year. I think, um, you know, I, we talked about, you know, in, in a nice way, we don't, there's no, we don't have time for pity parties because it could be a lot worse. We can be in a lot worse situations. But I think that's the key for us. It always, be, it always became about treating them like adults, letting them understand they were part of this process and they got it. This stinks. This is, this is like, like there is a, the worst possible scenario we could have is not, not allowing these seniors to play one more time, right? To have the women play, lose a season and a half if, if we don't get a chance to play in the spring. But there's no question in my mind that I think since May, we've been talking about different scenarios, keeping their options open. So when this, this news came down in the fall, we were all relieved because we knew that if we were going to have the best possible experience this year, spring was the best option, that the fall was going to be miserable. And we knew it. And so while we were ready to play, we also were, were ready to, to do what we can to, to, to make spring great. And, and yes, back when they made this decision, there was only a couple schools that decided not to play in the fall. But now there's, there's almost 25 schools that aren't playing in the fall. So finding games this spring will not be a problem. <laughs> so, and, and creating an opportunity to play for a championship and play a season will not be a problem because it's, it, it, because we have hope. And that's why like for us, for me, moving from the fall to the spring for this year was like, okay, they're, they're giving us an opportunity to have a great season. So it's up to us. I mean, we still have to do our part and, and, get, and remain safe, but it's up to us that when we're, whatever window they, the NCAA or our universities give us, to get a season in, we're going to do it. And we're going to, and I feel that we're going to do it. And it's going to be one of the most incredible things ever because this is something that's unprecedented. And we, we have a chance to make history playing in the spring. Um, and also just something that we could all, we'll have in common 20 years from now, go back and be like, hey, remember when 2020? And we're gonna laugh about it and we're gonna cheer about it. And we're gonna be like, yeah, how awesome was that? That we were able to make something. I mean, that's my hope, you know, but I'm, I'm, I treated them as adults. It's, it stinks. It still stinks, but you could be in a, we could be in a lot worse situation. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's great. You know, I, I hadn't thought about that looking back on it and in years to come and say how awesome it was that we kind of banded together as, as a water polo community to make this work for what we needed to. Yeah. I think that's the key. It's no pity parties, man. Everybody's going to want to do it their own. No, we all have to make, the smart compromise. And it's not about us as coaches because we'll be back next year. We have to give the student athletes the best possible experience. And I, and this gives us that opportunity. So I'm, like I said, the shoot, it still hasn't been, we still have a lot more stuff happening in the next couple of weeks. We'll sit back and when we get a decision on what's going to happen, we'll be ready to rock and roll. I could not think of a better way to end our call there. Thank you so much for, for joining me tonight. A uh, lot of fun. Thank you for stepping up and uh, co-hosting as well with yeah. Mike being gone. Yeah. You tell Mike he's gone. You tell Mike right. he's gone. <laughs> we'll do. Thank you so much for joining me. Of course. Uh, well, as we get closer to the fall season, we'll continue to profile teams and their coaches as we begin uh, breaking down the game and from team to team and, and looking at college water polo and looking at what the plans are for those different schools. Uh, if you have topics uh, that you'd like to talk about on the program or playing in college or people you want to be interviewed, contact us at cincywaterpolo at gmail.com or on Twitter at Cincy Water Polo. The Spin Lab is produced and recorded by Mike Jones and Nick Hellig and is supported by the Ohio Squirrels. If you're never too old to get in the game, go nuts. And also by Marlins Water Polo. For the love of the game, there's Marlins Water Polo. And our theme music is produced by Jason Shaw at Audio Nautics. See you next time on The Spin Lab. Take care, Nick.